चौधरी as our speaker for this i called it special seminar at the school of astrophysics uh, so when we were uh, organizing we were thinking of having the talk shubhan said do you think that it will fit the astrophysics school of astrophysics things because it's very far from astrophysics i said you see okay it's fine and as i always say to the students that there is no such division like this is this this is that everything is physics and we should be interested about interesting problems wherever we see so <laughs> now uh, i'm just today i had two surprises uh, with shubhay on the first one he said that he is a childhood friend and a para parar bondhu of my uh, cousin brother my aunt's son so he said i know i have heard your name from my very childhood i didn't know that and so shubhay was an alumnus from arsquail presidency college and uh, he was here from 2007 to 2010 then he went to iit bombay and was a masters did his masters from iit bombay and there also i had a pleasant surprise because back in 2011 uh, ritwan and i were visiting iit bombay and we gave a public lecture on astrophysics based on the request of the then head of the department of physics and he said that he was there in the audience as a student so long association it seems and then after his bsc he went to trinity college dublin from where he did his phd and is now a postdoc at the lawrence berkeley national lab and uh, he is going to talk tell us about elect electronic structure i guess and we're going to hear about the symbiosis of theory and experiment when it comes to these uh, kind of uh, problems questions okay so Let's welcome. What happened? Let's welcome Shubhayon. An automatic for check. Or to kotha noi ha. Yeah, I understand it. Okay, but should not be automatic. So. first of all let me switch up the video now should i give slide show this should not be automatic why not go back and do the screen because like yes oh. no this should be fine i think yeah. okay great so let's welcome shubhayan then does that work with that the automatic I, okay. no. that doesn't okay so i'm going to this should work yep this works perfect thank you very much thank you professor chatterjee and thank you to the department of astrophysics for arranging this on such a on such a short notice it's really thank you very much it feels great to be back at the university after such a long time back when i was a student it used to be called presidency college and soon after that it became a university and this is the first time i've stepped in this campus um while it's a university okay so um basically i wanted to talk to you about some of the new things that i learned about uh, using electronic structure theory for simulating electronic excited states <clears throat> so we all know that quantum systems can be in different quantum states of a uh, specific energy and the lowest one is called ground state and the higher energy ones are all called excited states now theoretically it's much easier to simulate ground state but when you try to simulate excited states it poses a lot of problems and so we learned some 
tricks of using ground state methods and tricking the ground state methods into simulating excited states and how experiment can help theory and theory can help experiment in this regard. So this is basically what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, cancel. Cancel. Let's cancel. Okay, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, please. Thank you. So, why electronic structure theory? Uh, why electronic structure at all? First of all, electron. If you study electrons carefully, it helps us a learn. It helps us learn a lot about the basic scientific principles that govern them. That's one reason. Another one is that um, if you can manipulate their properties according to your wishes, uh, you can exploit them for lots of technological purposes. So there are multiple interests behind studying electronic structure. Um, so it's very important that we are not just able to probe electronic structure, but also to be, able, but also to manipulate electronic structure. Most uh, commonly, electronic structure is probed through creating electronic excitations, so excited states. So in a very crude and simplistic model, you have your ground state like this, and the electrons will occupy energy specific quantum levels, which are also called orbitals. <coughs> and I'm showing this just for an atom, but this can be any, any, any material, molecule, a solid state system, anything. Um, in the ground state, the bottom most levels will all be filled. There can be tightly bound levels. There can be relatively loosely bound levels. And of course, there will be levels that are empty with no electrons in them. We'll talk about the validity of such a simplistic approximation later. Uh, but for now, let's just accept it and move on. Now, uh, now, if you give it some energy, if you give some energy to the system, the system can absorb energy and uh, move to what is called an excited state. So within, again, within this simplistic model, what will happen is one of the, one of the electrons can move from an occupied orbital to an unoccupied orbital. And depending on how much energy you have given to the system, you can uh, you can excite the electron from different occupied levels and to different unoccupied levels. And then usually the goal is to uh, record what's the energy absorbed and what's the probability of this transition. And from there, you try to infer something about the electronic structure of material. So this is the basic goal. Um, so there, there's this um, oxide called BCM for short, which has a lot of prospect in, in solar energy harvesting. So people try to study it. For In that material, if you excite one of the tightly bound electrons of the oxygen atom, you see something like this. So on the x-axis, you have the energy, absorbed energy. And here you have a measure of how many photons it absorbed. So this is what you get from experiment. And just from this plot, it's not super easy to infer anything about electronic structure at all. So in these cases, you typically ask for help from theory. And there you can see all sorts of analysis. For example, in BCM, there are two inequivalent sites for oxygen. So there, there's oxygen atom in the middle, we call, we call them OM, and there's oxygen middle, uh, oxygen atom, at the sides of the crystal, at the, of the unit cell, we call them OS. Theory can tell you which oxygen atom got excited to create which portion of the spectrum. So the actual final spe spectrum that you saw in experiment is actually a sum of these two lines. Theory can also tell you which spin channel got excited, the up spin channel or the down spin channel. And yeah, these are, so when you do experiment, you're, um, you, you, first of all, it's a solid. So you have continuous energy levels in the conduction uh, band, like block states. Uh, no, no, no. These are electronic levels. So molecular vibration levels, yes, those are different kinds of quantum levels. So th they are much lower in energy. These are electronic levels. So uh, if you disregard, for example, any ionic motion, if you assume that the ions are in fixed place, the electrons themselves can occupy different quantum states. So here I'm talking about probing them. 
So in, in exactly so it's a band, yes. In principle, since it's a many electron solid, technically there is no such thing as energy of one electron. It's an entangled system. So yeah, most importantly, you can see, you can uh, if you ask the question, okay, where did the excited electron go? Theory can tell you that. So for example, oh, so for example, if you send your oxygen core tightly bound electron to some sort of an orbital that looks like this, I'm not going to analyze this, but then you know that that will give rise to this particular and so on for all of the peaks. And so this is actually what you are looking for when, you, when I say analysis of electronic structure, this is what you are looking for from the experimental spectrum and theory can help you in that regard. So this is half of the symbiotic friendship where theory is helping experimental. Now, yes, exactly. So now we want the other side of the coin where experiment helps theory. And to appreciate that, let's look at this particular spectrum also for exciting an oxygen core electron, but this time in a simpler oxide, chromium dioxide, CRO. The specifics of the system will not be important for our discussion. But anyway, this is the experimental spectrum you get. Now, when we try to simulate, in simulate this in theory, we get something like this, which is very different from experiment. So right from the outset, theory experiment is telling us there might be something missing in our theory. So this is what we have to find out what could be missing in our theory. Oh. So how we simulated this was we calculated the core level, the oxygen 1s orbital very carefully. We call it, we are calling this phi zero and we are calculating the conduction level, the unoccupied level where the electron can go. We are still within the single electron. We are still assuming that electrons can be treated as single particles. We'll come to that later, but for now we are assuming that. Uh, but we calculated those levels also very carefully. We calculated them with what is called self-consistency. So that means that when we calculate this unoccupied orbital, we are taking into account the presence of the core hole already. So this is this knows the presence of the core hole. This knows where all the other electrons are. And we are calculating it in that way. And then we are calculating the probability of excitation from here. This is what this is fine. Yes. So we are calculating the probability of transition from this single electron level to this single electron level. But that didn't work. Uh, which one? No, that is the core state. That is the core level. The elect uh, the level where the electron was. And this is the level. Yes, this is the excited level. This is the level where the electron will be. And we calculated them and we got something like this. Well, the problem is that there is no such thing as exciting an electron because the electrons are entangled. You can only take the whole system from one quantum level, quantum state that if there are n electrons, you can take it from one n electron quantum state to another n electron quantum state. So when we take that into account, so basically we construct an n electron quantum state for the system. This is also, we are using some approximations there. We'll come to that later. But when we, when we compute that and we compute the transition probability from there to a, a higher energy n electron quantum state. Okay, now it's a very good match with experiment. Now notice that these two levels were not badly computed because we are using these two levels in our, um, in, a, in this better approximation, there's phi zero, there's phi tilde f. So these two levels were okay. It's just that the explicit presence of these other electrons were not considered here. So here, experiment taught us about what kind of physics is important in this problem. And there are many oxides where this, this level of approximation worked very well. So we were, I mean, when you see this for the first time, you'll be really surprised why didn't this work? Because not all systems are governed by the same physics, not this, the same physics is not dominant in all systems. <clears throat> okay, so what kind of theory can be used for this? In electronic structure theory, for many decades, 
the most most widely used approach has been something called density functional theory, which many people have heard of. So we'll start with that. It has lots of drawbacks and whatnot, but we'll start with that and then we'll see where, where it helps us. So in a nutshell, in Konsham density functional theory, what you try to do is you have this thing called a functional. A functional is something just like a function, but instead of depending on one variable, a functional depends on a function. And that function it's here is the density of your system. So the electron density is a function of R. Now, the density function theory says that there is such a functional that if you minimize this with respect to the density of the system for a given external potential, now the external potential is determined by where the ions are. The ions are creating the external potential that the electrons feel. So if you minimize this with respect to density, then at the minimum, you get the ground state density and the functional spits out the value of the uh, ground state energy. So this is the this is the basic thing, and uh, th th this thing is uh, this is just like a Lagrange term. It's here just to preserve the total number of electrons. We want the total number of electrons fixed at n. Now this functional is not known at all, and it's very hard to approximate this functional in this form. So what people do is people often invoke what is called the Konsham scheme, where we try to find a non-interacting system of electrons whose ground state density is the same as that of the interacting system. And that, like, we are, people try to do this because non-interacting electrons are super easy to solve because electrons, it, you can treat those electrons as independent particles. They each have their own quantum levels. And that non-interacting system is called Konsham. And notice that the only connection between the Konsham system and the real system is that they have the same ground state density. That's the only connection. But there are ways of trying to approximate such non-interacting system. Absolutely. Yes, in, in, a, in a Konsham system, the electrons are absolutely non-interacting. And so Konsham system, non-interacting electrons, you can solve the Schrodinger equations, single particle Schrodinger equation. And that Schrodinger equation would look like this where this external potential is the same as the previous external potential. Sorry, this is small, this is uh, capital, but this is, uh, sorry, this is the same, the same external potential. But now this term VHXC, it's for short for Hartree exchange correlation. This encodes all of the effects of the electron electron interaction that was there in the actual system, but that we do not want in the Konsham system. So now each Konsham electron is feeling this whole thing as the external potential. And notice that this HXC term itself depends on the density. So we have to solve this equation iteratively. We find the Konsham orbitals, we calculate density, we solve again until we achieve but convergence. So, but it is better. It's not like just uh, looking at the radial part. It is better because yes. Right? Yes. Yes. This is uh, a bold R, vector R. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. This is vector R. O always. No, uh, which one? Yeah. This. The interaction and non interaction are the same. But for such room. Yes, and in most cases, barring some extreme pathological case, such a system can be found. It can be found. Yes. That's the case. That's the case. That's uh, the system exists. We don't know. The guess is, I mean, uh, approximation is this thing. This is the approximation. We know this exists and we are trying to get as close as possible to this system. But yes, electrocorrelation and exchange also what is called, or even the hard free term. So even the classical interaction, I've included this here. And the good thing is that this is completely local. So this is a multiplicative term. So it's not like an operator in the sense that it, uh, it's just a multiplicative operator. So, so it's easy to find. If you know the approximation, it's easy to solve. Yes. And so, okay, once you have the orbitals, you can find the uh, density. You plug that density into this functional and that will give you your ground state energy. So this is Konsham scheme in a nutshell. Okay, that's all for ground state. I said we are more interested in excited states. So what can we do about that? 
And many people have proposed um, many exciting ways of tricking DFT into um, giving you excited states. I'll show you a very simple, or rather extremely simplistic method that we proposed some time ago. What we do is, first you start with a regular ground state calculation. You find the occupied cone sham subspace. And let's say we denote it by this operator P. And then, and then you run another DFT self-consistent field calculation, but now you impose an additional condition that this erstwhile occupied subspace must contain one less electron now. So this subspace now has to contain n minus one electron and that other electron has to decide somewhere outside this subspace. And then you re-optimize this whole thing. <coughs> and <clears throat> mathematically, it's also uh, pretty straightforward to do. This is the equation that I showed you for ground state DFT. But this time you have an additional uh, condition that within this subspace denoted by P, the total number of electrons, this trace gives you the total number of electrons, must be n minus 1. This is an additional condition that you have to solve this in presence of. So this is a constrained minimization problem. We usually use Lagrange's trick in this kind of a problem. So instead of E, we form a different functional and we invoke a Lagrange multiplier, Vc. Um, and if you do all the maths, it turns out Basically, so basically W must now be optimized with respect to both the density and the Lagrange multiplier. And it gives you uh, two nested loops. So in the outer loop, it turns out that you have to maximize W with respect to the Lagrange multiplier. And for each maximum, then in the inner loop, you have to do a regular density, regular minimization with respect to density like you do for ground state DFT. Yeah. It's the density operator, yes. This is the projection operator on the subspace. So this is how you're defining the subspace, yes, the projection operator. So the trace will give you the number of electrons in this subspace, yeah, perfect. And so this is actually very relatively easy to implement and uh, very quick calculations, quicker than most other methods. Uh, and it's giving you pretty reliable um, energy. So this is the lowest excited state energy compared to experiment in uh, brown in uh, orange in orange, and XDFT is what we call this method neutral excitation DFT in uh, blue. Oh, so these are sorry. These are various molecules that we've proved. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, actually, yes. So we try, we tested. In most cases, it's giving you giving us lower value. We we tested on many other molecules. Uh, so for some of them, it's actually giving you a little bit higher value. There's there's another level of approximation here that we that I didn't mention. Um, in the sense that, okay, uh, in the lowest excited state, what is what's called a singlet state, you cannot describe the wave function as one single Slater determinant. So an anti-symmetrized product. In ground state, you can, but in the lowest excited state, when you, when you have the total spin equal to zero, your actual state cannot do that. But your cone sham state will always be a Slater determinant because cone sham only knows non-interacting electrons. It cannot go beyond that. For that, you need to use some further approximations, which sort of try to uh, underestimate the energy a little bit. Why are you are not emitting the electron. The electron is still in the. Yes. One of the. We are saying one of the electrons needs to be ejected, but we don't know where. We just impose the condition that, okay, maybe this is the whole space. This is the whole space you're allowed to work with. Within this space, you need n minus one. So that other electron has to live somewhere else and the code will take care of where it will put it to minimize the energy in presence of that condition. Take out of, take out of that subspace, but still include in the, con in the calculation. So your system is still neutral. It's not ionized, yes. It's just excited, yes. We'll talk about ionized in a bit. Yeah. Anyway, so 
what we did is we used DFT, we tricked DFT a little bit. Um, and uh, by the way, the, the uh, excited state calculations, they are not complete as hand-waving as they sound. They have some solid basis in what's called um, exact theorems for excited, exact DFT-based theorems for excited state. Um, but they involve heavy amounts of approximation, not the theorems, the calculation, yeah. So anyway, we used DFT, we tricked DFT a little bit, and that gave us decent energies. But that's also, that's only part of the story. We want the transition probabilities as well to get the spectrum, because I showed you the spectrum, that's what we are after. And DFT said nothing about spectrum. It only talked about energies and density. That's all it knows about. So we have to dig a little bit deeper using some more preliminary quantum mechanics. So preliminary quantum mechanics, which we'll start with the very basic wave function. Let's say somehow you, some by some magic, you found the n electron wave function of a system. <clears throat> so psi, and it depends on n uh, real space coordinates. Now you just have to store it on a, let's say 10 by 10 by 10 XYZ real space grid. <clears throat> so for a hydrogen atom, you have one electron, so you have to store 10 times 10 times 10 values. If each value takes one byte, you'll have to store a thousand bytes. It's nothing too abnormal. Now a slightly heavier atom, sulfur atom, has 16 electrons. So now three axis, 16 electrons, you have to store 10 to the power three times 16 bytes. And just to give you an idea of how ridiculous this number is, if you're storing them in hard disks of one terabyte each, let's say each hard disk is hundred gram, then this is 10 to the power 35 kilograms. That's heavier than the mass of the earth. Because you have three uh, axes and you have 16 electrons, right? So you have, you have, you, you, you want to store them on three axes, <coughs> but you have to do that for 16 electrons. For every, for every value of, so, okay. So let's say here, here you will have 48 parameters. Psi will depend on 48 numbers, X, Y, Z, and for 16. Yes, and you're saying, I'm, I'm saying there are, you're storing them on 10 real space grades. So you, the, your psi now depends on 48 number of parameters and you will have to store each of them in a 10 by 10 by 10 and, and 10 grids. Hmm? No, each, each, each 10, each point in those 10 by 10 by 10 is one. You, that's, that's one for each electron. But you need to store all of the electrons individually, all 16 of them. 48. So, okay. No, no. Okay. Uh, if you look at this number, this psi is dependent on 48 numbers. Okay. So, if you change any of that number, you need to store psi for them. And each of them can take 10 values. Each of those 48 numbers can take 10 values. Any, any, any of the 10 values. So this makes it a ridiculous problem to solve. There's, and this is for one sulfur atom. Nobody cares about a sulfur atom. You care about complicated proteins and oxides and whatnot. So um, yeah, imagine like in a typical system, it's even in a very small system, you can have a thousand atoms. So 10 to the power 3000 va values. So bottom line is you need approximations. Yes. Oh, really? Okay. 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 So it's heavier than the sun for a sulfur atom. Okay. So bottom line is you need very solid approximations. So we'll try to find some approximations then. Okay, uh, we'll start with basis sets. This is the complicated object that we set out to approximate. Now, the thing is that we know any wave function that resides in an n-dimensional Hilbert space 
can be written as a linear combination of basis functions of that n-dimensional Hilbert space. So we'll try to find easy basis functions to work with. And probably one of the easiest basis functions for the n-dimensional Hilbert space will be n electron non-interacting systems. Now, non-interacting is easy because it's just a product of the wave functions product, but then you have to anti-symmetrize because electrons are fermions. So the full wave function must be anti-symmetric with respect to exchange. So, and those things are called Slater determinants. So they're nothing but just anti-symmetrized product of the single particle wave functions. Now, I said single particle wave functions. Which single particle wave functions? Again, it doesn't matter as long as the single particle wave functions span the one dimensional Hilbert space. So as long as that is satisfied, you are free to choose. So for example, let's say I chose this set of single particle wave functions, psi one, psi two, and I constructed up to infinity, and I constructed my Slater determinants from them, these phi k objects, and they will also go up to infinity. Let's say someone else chose this set of single particle wave functions, psi one prime, psi two prime, and so on, and they constructed their Slater determinants, phi, phi k prime, phi one prime, phi two prime, and so on. Now, if we both try to express our desired object with our basis functions, now our in n dimension, our basis functions are the stated determinants. Of course, we'll get different coefficients of linear expansion, but we'll both be able to do this exactly. <clears throat> but since we are getting different linear, uh, different uh, coefficients, this gives us some possible flexibility. So if we choose our single particle wave functions so cleverly, that one of the k's for, for, for a particular value of k, your ck is close to one and all the others go to zero, then we can say, not exactly, but within some approximation, we can approximate this complicated object as just one Slater determinant. That is super easy to work with, no problem there. Okay, that is not always guaranteed to exist. They exist. There can be states for which you absolutely cannot do that. We call, we call it static correlation. If the electrons have what is called strong static correlation, this is hopeless. But if such a choice exists, then I'll kind of present an intuitive way of what such a choice will be, what it would look like. So electrons are entangled. They are in interacting with each other. So as I mentioned, there is no such thing as energy of an electron or wave function of an electron. So in experiments, very often we say, we took, out an, 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 we took out an energy of this electron, or we put in an energy of this electron. What do we really mean? What actual quantity are we talking about? We are talking about addition or removal energies because total energy is something meaningful. So you measure the energy of the system, you take out an electron, you measure the energy again, you take the difference and you say, okay, that was the energy of the taken out electron. <clears throat> so it's always, uh, defined in terms of electron addition or electron removal and total energy differences. And in a similar spirit, you can also associate a single particle wave function to an electron. <coughs> so what you'll do is uh, this, this object, this operator AI, what it does is if it acts on a bra, it adds a particle at the ith single particle level. If it acts on a ket, it removes, if, but if it acts on a bra, it adds the, anyway. So what you what you say is, okay, if you start with the ground state, zero is ground state of an n electron system, and you add an electron, and you see that, okay, the resulting state is actually very similar to the n plus one electron state in some quantum level, let's say s, then what we would what we would think is this, okay, we had the state, we added an electron without disturbing anything else, and we got another quantum state. So this must be the state that the, this must be the single particle state that that electron was added in. So now you associate this object with the wave, you call this object approximately as the wave function of that added electron. So essentially it's So here, the excitation you are talking about are not neutral anymore because you're changing the number. So there can be different kinds of excitations, neutral excitations, or there can be charged excitations. Here, when you are talking about this object, you are always talking about charged excitations. And this thing, so mathematically, this all, all this, all that physical thing happens if this thing is, it has a norm of one, it can be shown. And we call this, so 
interacting particles are not really to be treated as particles. They are not independent particles. So we call them quasi particles because we are making this independent approximation, but with the reservation that we know that they are not actually independent. So we call them quasi particles. And if they exist, then there's a relatively easy prescription for finding them, which I'm showing you without proof. It's called the quasi-particle equation. So this part, it looks like a non-interacting Hamiltonian, your kinetic energy and the external potential. But this thing, this uh, sigma, now look, notice that this is not multiplicative anymore. This encodes all of the effects of electron-electron interaction, and this is called self-energy. <coughs> um, and that, if you solve this, uh, and uh, note that this is all this is dependent on the eigenvalues themselves. So you also have to solve this iteratively in practice. Uh, in most cases, we don't do that. But if you can do that, that gives you your quasi-particle energy, so electron addition or removal energies, and the corresponding single particle wave functions. Now, the fun thing happens is that there is something called a generalized Konsham equation. It's a little bit different from Konsham. In Konsham, your electrons are absolutely non-interacting. In generalized Konsham, your electrons can have a partial type of interaction. So for example, they can interact by a fraction of the exchange force. But anyway, uh, and uh, there's something called hybrid functional DFT, which is very common. So if you're in that realm, you're never doing Konsham, you're always doing generalized Konsham. But the thing is that, Quasi-particle equation looks awfully similar to the generalized Konsham equation, which is much easier to solve, the generalized Konsham equation is. Um, so this has kind of motivated the widespread use of generalized Konsham or even Konsham equations, their energies and wave functions, as approximate quasi-particle wave functions. So now you have a two-step approximation. First, you actually want this complicated many electron object, which is hopeless. But then you realize that for some systems, your inter your electrons can be treated as kind of interacting quasi particles. So that's one step. And then you realize that instead of having to solve the complicated quasi particle equation, maybe you can get away with generalized Konsham equations. So it's kind of like a two step approximation, which can break down at either or both steps. But if they both work, then you have a super simple solution for a super complicated problem. Um, so it's hard, <laughs> okay. So there's something called spectral function, which is kind of a measure of where your electron is taken out from. If you, if you, can, you can determine it experimentally, there are more complicated ways of calculating it. So if you calculate it and you see that the spectral functions are very sharp. So that means that if you take out an, so sorry, the X axis is energy and the Y axis is kind of like probability. So if they're very sharp at different energies, that means that if you remove an electron from that energy or add an electron, then it, it has very little wiggle room. It comes specifically from that energy. That means that you, you can approximate them. It, there are different ways of looking at it. There, again, if, a quantum chemist's approach would be what is called static correlation. So if you must include multiple slated determinants to express a wave function, but it's the, it's a similar kind of approach. The physicist's approach is usually using spectral function. What is the spectral energy? Yes, but that is not for taking out an electron. Though. That is for exciting an electron. The spectrum that I showed you, yeah. Not necessarily. This, that means this approximation is good enough. The quasi-particle approximation is good enough. This will then depend on how clever you are in choosing this thing. Yes, so I mean there are there are, there have been lots of efforts and lots of literature on what would be good as this functional, and it turns out that this is also heavily system dependent, and uh, yeah, people have tried to construct it from basic physics, from fitting with experiments, from and this is an ongoing research field.
Okay, with that kind of a background, let's delve into a specific problem. You have your ground state. You give it so much energy that you eject one electron. So now you have one less electron in the system and we'll treat this as the initial state. Now this state will de-excite by demoting one of these higher energy electrons to this uh, core level, to this tightly bound level. So it will release some energy. What you will do is you'll measure the energy and you'll measure the intensity. And from that, you'll try to learn things about the system. So uh, the, the photon will be in the X-ray range because it's, it's, it has a very high energy difference. So it won't be in the visible range. So, uh, it can be anyone, it can be anyone. Depending on which one comes down, you'll have different energies. It, so at this point, it's not my choice anymore because the system is, uh, the, so this is what I did. I gave it some energy, it got excited. But then the system will, it, by itself, it will de-excite and it will, uh, I mean, okay, in the actual system, you won't just have one molecule. You, you'll have thousands of molecules. Maybe one molecule decided it will de-excite this electron. Maybe one molecule decided it will de-excite this electron. So from the first molecule, you'll receive a little bit lower emitted energy. From the second molecule, you'll receive a little bit higher emitted energy. And they will, the intensities will also differ. So you'll get a map of energy versus intensity. That's what you'll be able to measure. <laughs> so one of the most popular ways of doing this kind of thing in theory is what's called response-based rule. There's something called linear response time dependent DFT. Um, there's something called the bethe salpeter equation, which comes from nuclear physics, but people have stolen it in electronic structure theory. But they all try to kind of approach the problem in this way. So what they do is they try to find this thing called the density-density uh, response function, which is kind of a measure of how much your density changes non-locally at a different R and T for some change in the external potential. And why we want this is because this can give you the exact dielectric function of the material, and that can give you the spectrum in turn. So uh, we try to calculate this object. Now, this object is also pretty hard to calculate. So what we do is just like the Kohlschamp scheme, we again delegate this problem to a fictitious simpler problem. And in this case, now it's a two particle Hamiltonian because now you're creating, you're not taking out a particle, you're or putting in a particle, you're exciting a particle. So you're creating a particle whole pair. You, you have an electron whole pair. So now your two particle Hamiltonian, those two particles is one electron, one hole. And we usually solve it within what is called the adiabatic approximation, which kind of neglects all the history when it is calculating the electron hole interaction. Because if you take that into account, you're more accurate, but uh, the calculation becomes very, very expensive. So in electronic structure theory, you always have to strike the balance between accuracy and uh, expense. That's basically all of electronic structure theory, really. So anyway, your initial state is this. Um, this uh, this operator this with this dagger on top, it creates an electron on this state. This is the null state. So you are creating the ajth electron for j equal to 1 to n. So you're populating the bottom most valence levels. This green level is labeled as 0. So we are not putting any electron there. And we have a tilde on top. So that tilde means that we have calculated all of these levels self-consistently in presence of this pole. So all when all of these levels were calculated, they took into account the presence of this hole. And then you have populated them and you have constructed that Slater determinant. And that is your initial state, the core ionized states, so to speak. Now for the final state, your linear response says that it can approximate the final state as a linear combination of what is called singles. Singles is if you're given a reference state, which is your initial state, you can create singles on top of that simply by moving an electron from one level to another without disturbing anything else. So it's a non-self-consistent thing. It cannot exist because when you move an electron, everything else moves, but that's called a single. And what linear combination, what linear response is telling you is that the actual final self-consistent state 
it can approximate that as a linear combination of these non-self-consistent de-excitations. So you can de-excite this electron, you can de-excite this electron, and if you had more electrons, so on and so forth. And these coefficients of linear expansion will be given to you if you solve the linear response equation, the two-particle Hamiltonian. So if you solve the two-particle Hamiltonian, you will get these coefficients. So here, what you're doing is essentially on top of the initial state, your reference state, you're creating a core electron, A0, and you are destroying this AJ electron, and then you're taking a linear combination of that. That's your response-based final state. And you have something called the transition operator, which governs the transition from one minibody state to another. If you sandwich that operator between the initial state and the final state, that will give you your transition amplitude. So this is how you calculate the transition amplitude. We did this for two molecules. One is for a chloromethane, where we excited the chlorine 1s electron. And we got pretty decent match between the, so the blue one is linear response time dependent DFT. It's a pretty decent match with experiment. But when we did this for phenol, exciting the oxygen 1s electron, this is horrible. So something went wrong here, experiment told us. And we have to find out what went wrong. Now, I have told you that the actual final state is an n electron system or n plus one electron system. And in principle, it's expressible as linear combination of determinants from the n plus one, n minus one particle Hilbert space. But that means that in principle, there is no guarantee that you, you can be satisfied only with singles. There can be what's called doubles. So now you need to move two electrons from occupied to unoccupied levels, or even higher than three electrons and so on. So in principle, they can be needed. So our singles approximation is not necessarily good enough. So when do these doubles type terms become dominant? That's actually pretty easy to see. Notice that in these singles terms, you are always de-exciting one of the electrons to the core, but you are never touching any of these conduction levels. Conductions are the higher energy uh, unoccupied levels. So if for some reason, your actual final state has any presence in these conduction orbitals that must come from doubles or higher order terms, because singles simply cannot contribute to them. So if this blue condition is satisfied, then your beta coefficients or even higher order coefficients must be non-zero. We already know in that in the adiabatic linear response, your final state was approximated as a linear combination of singles. So if this blue condition is satisfied, then your gamma, all the gamma coefficients can never be equal to the alpha coefficients because the beta coefficients exist. So if they both have to be normalized, if this has a norm of one or n, and if this has the same norm, then alpha can never be equal to gamma. And that means that the transition probability can never be of the actual final state can never be equal to that of the response-based approximate calculation. So your response-based approximation, approximate calculation, a diabetic response-based will be wrong. Now, one thing to, uh, and okay, so when does this happen? That happens when the, after the de-excitation, the other electrons move around so much that they encroach into this conduction space. When that happens, this that, that's when this blue condition is satisfied, then all of this breaks down. So that means that when there is a large change in polarization of the other electrons, they move around too much. And um, it's important to note that the actual culprit here is the adiabatic approximation where we neglected all the history dependence in the electron hole interaction. Because if you uh, relax, if you, if you don't have that additional approximation, then this fictitious object, you don't have to normalize anymore. And then all of the problems, they go away. And so if you calculate that, difference in polarization, you see that that is actually much higher for this molecule where it didn't work. For the molecule where it worked, it's much lower. So basically the problem boils down to, if you do something to one electron, do the other electrons stay still? If they stay still, then your adiabatic approximation is okay. But if the other electrons move around too much, then your adiabatic approximation will fail. So, one way to get out, one way to solve this, to kind of remedy this, is to run a full self-consistent calculation for every possible state. 
Your final state, you run one self-consistent calculation in presence of the core hole. Your final state, you run one self-consistent calculation in presence of the valence hole. And if you do that, now you get pretty decent match with experiment. That's your green spectrum. And we are mostly interested in uh, the relative intensities of, between the different peaks. The energies, we have found them to be heavily dependent on that VHXC thing. So we are less worried about them because we are not trying to tune the functional. We are just trying to get the right method. And we are most interested in getting at least all the peaks right, which it does now. But now the drawback is that for every possible final state, you need one separate calculation. So if you have a large number of electrons, you can de-excite a large number of electrons that you can de-excite. So for every possible electron, now you need a separate calculation. That makes the, the thing extremely heavy. So what we realized is that the ground, the core electron is so tightly bound that you need to treat that self-consistently. So the other electrons will feel its presence or absence very heavily because it's it's like a defect. However, the valence electrons are delocalized. So they have little charge at every value of R. So maybe you can get away with not treating them self-consistently. So then we introduce this partially self-consistent method where in the initial state, you are doing all the calculation, keeping in mind that there is a core hole. But in the final state, you are just using these frozen ground state orbitals because they were calculated in presence of the core electron anyway, and you want the core electron in the final state. But you're just taking out one valence electron non-self-consistently without relaxing anything else. Without going into the mathematical details, this gives you pretty good spectrum in comparison with the fully orbital optimized density functional theory. Um, and I'm showing you this just for two molecules, but this is true for a large number of molecules. And also we treated, we did this for solids that also works. Yeah. yeah. That's experiment, yes. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. These are just rigidly moved. Oh, sorry. No, no. The curves are, I just rigidly moved them to plot them on a, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Okay. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand now that this can be very misleading. Okay, that those were moved by me by hand. Okay, so we went over the two towers of doing excited state calculation. The first tower is the adiabatic linear response. The good thing is that it's one calculation to rule all the excitations. But the bad thing is that it will break if the other electrons move around too much and change a lot in polarization. The other tower is the orbital optimization. It's very accurate. That's the good thing. But the bad thing is that now you need a separate calculation for every de excitation. That's the bad thing. Okay, now taking a step back, the whole point of doing this was so that we can learn something about electronic structure. So we can probe electronic structure. So what can we probe from such a from such a thing? Well, we can probe the occupied electron structure because those are the orbitals from which you can de-excite the electrons. So those you have access to, but you are missing out on a lot because you are missing out on all these unoccupied levels. You don't have much information about them from this kind of an experiment. What we would ideally want is we want one experiment that will probe everything all the unoccupied levels, all of these occupied levels, and any valence electron hole interaction outside the core region, because that's what's, what, um, what makes excitons in solids, like bound electron hole pairs. And they have a lot of uh, importance, both in terms of basic science and technology. So we want all of them, we want to study all of them, occupied, unoccupied, and electron hole interaction together. So if we want to probe them, we need a richer process. And the richer process is what is called resonant scattering. You start with your ground state, you give it some energy, not enough to eject one electron this time. This time enough to just promote one electron. 
to a higher unoccupied level. And now you have access to the unoccupied levels. Now you can probe the unoccupied levels. Okay, then what will happen is one of the valence occupied electrons will drop down. Maybe the same electron that you promoted, maybe some other electron, but something will drop down to the core. So this gives you access to the unoccupied levels. And now you have electron hole pair. So you have access to probing electron hole pairs. now. So you, all of them in one experiment. So it's very information rich, very good. But then the problem is that with great information content comes great difficulty in extracting the information. So you need some very powerful tools for simulating and analyzing such a complicated process. Now, the problem is that if you use the adiabatic response-based method, then you can run into those polarization problems. And also, in many cases, especially for core excitations, they can be very expensive, especially if you want to do them for solids. And if you want to do the orbital optimized method, then you need a separate calculation for all of them. So this is a classic problem of how to have your cake and eat it too. And usually the solution is always you have to buy another cake. You need two cakes. And for us, um, one cake is the orbital optimized approach for core excitation, which you have in the middle, in the intermediate state, because we saw this works. And the other one is for the final valence excited state where your core is filled. You can use the adiabatic response based method because this has been tried and tested for uh, many, many years. And um, so this is this is the problem that you are trying to solve. Your ground state is your ground state. No problem there. You have filled your core, core orbital. You have filled the bottommost n valence orbitals. Then your intermediate state. Now your core is empty. Notice there is no a zero and the bottommost n valence levels are now occupied, you're filling them in, but you're calculating them self-consistently in absence of the core electron. That's what the tilde will denote everywhere. And now you're putting one other conduction electron, one other high energy electron in some level. In this case, it's the blue level, K. But this is your intermediate state. But the final state, we decided to do the linear response rule on top of the ground state. So it will create singles, single electron hole pairs on top of the ground state. So for example, if you look at this one, this is found exactly from the ground state just by promoting this purple electron to this gray level. That's it, and not relaxing anything else. And then if you take a linear combination of all of them, all such singles, that will give you your final state, core field, but electron hole pair in the valence region now. <laughs> And um, I'll uh, go through this very quickly. Um, this is how you calculate the transition probability. You have your input energy, output energy, and the polarizations of the input and output. You have transition from the ground state to intermediate state, which is x, and from intermediate state to final state. And you have to sum over, for a given final state, you have to sum over all possible intermediate states because you know, for going from ground to final, it can go through any channel of intermediates. So you have to sum over all of them. And also, finally, you have to sum over final states as well, because the system can end up in any possible final state, any possible final valence excited state. So you have to sum over all possible final states also in the end. And you can calculate these transition probabilities, ground, ground to core excited, and also core excited to final. You can calculate these transition probabilities. You'll plug them into this expression. This actually comes directly from second order perturbation theory. And that will give you your uh, transition probabilities. And we calculated them for a very small test case molecule, a methanol molecule for exciting the carbon <clears throat> 1s electron. And we didn't rely on the cone sham DFT uh, eigenvalues. We did explicit quasi particle calculations just to be sure that we're doing the right thing. And we see that these bright spots are in exactly the same position as the experiment. These, these uh, rings are just rigidly shifted between the two panels. So they, ha they have no relative shift. And that's just to show that the uh, spots are spot on. Uh, <clears throat> but in the experimental spectrum, you have these uh, long vertical lines and they actually come from uh, additional vibrational excitations. This is what you were mentioning. Um, when you are not just exciting an electron, but also you end up exciting the ions also, <clears throat> the vibrational modes. But we haven't taken them into account for our 
computational method. It's purely for electronic excitations and de-excitations. And that it treats pretty well. Now, if you somehow neglect the electron hole interaction in the final state, you calculate the states very well, but you neglect the electron hole interaction. Now it's all messed up. So you calculated the quasi particle, you did the quasi particle calculations, which is which, which, what we call single shot GW, but there is no what is called Bethe Salpeter equation, which takes into account the electron hole interaction. Now the spectrum is completely messed up. So this kind of shows you A, that it's important to include those electron hole interactions in your calculation and b that experimentally you can actually probe electron hole pairs this is one of our motives of doing this whole experiment anyway so it captures the electron hole interaction the experimental result captures the electron hole interaction very well um okay just simulating the spectrum is not enough because you already have the spectrum from experiment what you really want is analysis of the spectrum so that means kind of asking okay where did this spot come from? Where did this spot come from? So I'll show you, for example, for spot C, which is here. I'll actually move a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so spot C, which is here, if I ask you, okay, what core excited state did your core electron go to? And the answer is, it looks like it looks like this orbital. And notice that we actually excited this like this um, this atom. So this orbital has a p type character on this atom. And this is actually needed from selection rule, which says that if you're exciting an S electron, the orbital angular momentum can only change by plus minus one. So it has to go to a P-type orbital. And you show that you see that that's actually happening. So that's reassuring that that's happening. And in the final state, we did linear response. So it will be a, it, it will be a sum of electron hole pairs, a linear combination of electron hole pairs. And what our calculation will tell you is that okay, for this particular one, this electron hole pair will be dominant. It will have a very high coefficient. So if you remove an electron from a ground state occupied orbital that looks like this and put it in a conduction orbital that looks like this, that will be done. For other spots, maybe for example, for B, you can have multiple such electron hole pairs that all contribute pretty dominant. Okay, so this is kind of to conclude that we saw, first of all, that theory can benefit a lot from experiment. In practice, all theory is experiment, except for like hydrogen atom or something. You basically have to approximate always. And the main question is which approximation is adequate for, for which problem? So in this case, we saw that approximating electrons, approximating the transition just from the single electron orbitals was not enough. However, approximating the full electronic wave function as a single state determinant, that's also an approximation. That is enough for this. Maybe there are systems for which even this will not be. And maybe there are systems for which even this will be. So that's something. We saw that uh, when we compared the different methods for treating excited states, we saw that the individual methods, they all come with their own strengths and weaknesses. That's something we saw when we compared the adiabatic linear response with the orbital optimized DFT type approach. But if for some method, so if for some type of a, type of a problem, you can bring in all of those methods together, you can leverage all of their strengths. And that's a very happy thing for electronic structured theory because that can kind of uh, simulate very complicated experiments or treat very complicated problems with, with relatively much easier means and inexpensive means. So uh, with that, I thank you all. What's the next one tomorrow? It's asking and So um, in the experiment, when you are exciting something, what is, how, how is it done? How is it done? Um, basically, you have to delete the code. So at our lab, there is this synchrotron called advanced light source. We need to electronic window. So we, uh, we, we basically accelerate our start. For so from that accelerating the other code, we direct those points onto the system and give this Is it similar to the system or here we have it's it's as similar as the other Is there a reason why for the intelligence and you see that some other um the one we decide for the excellent one. 
And uh, you mentioned about the uh, vibrational level, the vibration level. So, um, just like for the electronic structure and the radial energy level, this elaborate calculation can be done. I mean, the vibrational mode, I mean, rotational mode calculation also needs that kind of detail. That yes. Is. Yes, but of course, there are little different because so, vibration is one of those. The details will be different, but they do need the other So, when you are comparing the experiment, is that a problem that sometimes? Yes. So, for example, I told you that you don't have those vertical lines that have either been neglected the vibration. But we can take them into account. And starting from the we can add those vibrations and as far as it is. We can treat them. But of course, that makes it a little bit more easy. Yes, we have not used it, but yes, we know that, for example, for some systems, we have extremely low energy consumption, there are the orbits. The orbits, the electrons are more levels. So they need some additional light. You can do a regular regular phone can be able to get very approximately. We know, for example, that if over the localization, so for them, for those systems, we need that kind of energy. Why 